just in case you're wondering, from the actual body mesh. And then split that up into front, back, and sole. Okay. It's just more realistic. Each one's got its own little seam thing. Now I need to unwrap it, so I'm going to start with the back. And set. What we're going to do is, if you know, what unwrapping is, is placing it onto a texture sheet, so you can actually texture it properly. And the only way to do it is to show you how one is. Let's put it, first of all, let's put a checkered map on it, so you can see how badly unwrapped it is. So let's go call Assign Material. So grab any of the open slots, click the Assign Material to Selection, Show End Result, call it Checkered Map. And then you go and get, literally there's a checkered map already in the program. Go on your diffuse. There's the color. Don't click on the color. Right next to this little block. Click on it. Go and select check. Make sure it shows end result, which is this little checkered rectangle with the light bulb. As you can see, it looks horrible. Go and tile it 20 by 20 or 30 by 30, depending on your scene. You want it to be pretty small cubes. As you can see, this if you texture this, this is going to look hideous. Yeah, you can slap a flat color onto that, it would be fine, but if you actually want to put a texture onto it, it's not going to work. So let's start off piece by piece. Let's start with the back of it. We call this boot deal. And let's unwrap it. Unwrap tools are on your modified tab. Everything is in your modified tab. It's called unwrap UV, 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 UVW. Click on it. The green is your existing seam. What a seam is, if you're wearing your pants or any clothes you're wearing right now, there is a stitched seam, whether it's on the side of your pants, around your sleeve of your arm, that is a seam. That's where you'd put a seam if you were making your shirt, is on the sides and the top and on the side of your sleeve seams. So look at the existing seams and use them as actual, use a real world example. The only downside is when you're making a person who don't have seams, there's no stitched hidden areas or anything, we were just cling wrapped. Okay, so we, in that case, we have to make our own little seams for the person. I'm going to be running through how to unwrap your entire character next week. Because of all the screw-ups of the public holidays, you don't have to pose your character and you don't have to skin it. And you don't have to make a wig. You can if you want. Then if, all you have to do is have it modeled, sculpted, and have your displacement and everything working nicely. In. So you don't have to have the texture. You can slap a simple skin color if you want. Okay, it's because it's just we're running out of time very quickly. So let's get started. Go drop down here, click on the plus, there's pot, vertex, edge, and polygon. Generally, you will work with polygon. Go control H, select all of it. In this case, I did not press control A, sorry. Okay, and just select all of it. And now we're going to do it. There is the multiple ways of projecting. You can do seam, make your own seams. In this case, we just need to do a planar projection. So you select projection over here, there's planar, the cylindrical. There is sphere, and then there is box. Let's just go planar, and then you go X, Y, and Z to make sure it faces the right way. We want to face it to the back. As you can see, the checkers are looking nice towards the back, just on the side that's stretching a bit. We will fix that. Go to your open UV editor over here, UV tools, and let's fix this problem. The key to making this is making the checkers perfectly square. Go to your tools. Everything you're going to use is under your tools. Go under your relax. Always relax by to center is exactly what it does. It relaxes everything to one little point, as you can see there. They are everything's packed neatly into one little block point. You don't want that. You want either edge or polygon. Okay, so we're going to go by polygon. Click start. As you can see, the little, little unwrapping twist and stretching out, and let it go. It will do a hundred iterations. What that means is it will cycle a hundred times before it stops. The amount is given. It's how strong it, the relax is. If you set it to one, it might actually relax too much, which can actually happen. Now just rotate it, move it out of the way. And now you'll notice perfect checks all the way through. This might not be important to someone sculpting a Z brush. This is very important to people doing game. Please don't screw up your UVs. Okay. Convert to poly when you're done. And there we go. Okay. Unhide all, and then go to the next piece. Let's do the tongue. Tongue is the same, it's pretty open, so you can actually just put a UV unwrap and just put planar again. So go to it, make sure you select all of it. Your planar. Just make sure it faces the front. So just go X, Y, and find there you go. It is decent. And click open UV. And now you're going to relax it again. Relax is your best tool. 
every other package took it from Max. Max's U unwrapping tools are the best. And then comes Blender. Because Blender actually need it because they've got a built-in gaming engine. Max has always had to have decent UVs, once again because they make games. Go, it's done. Rotate it back up. This is literally the front of your boot. Just remember what you're actually unwrapping while you're doing it because you don't want to get confused. Convert it to a poly. And there we go. Perfect checks all the way through. Everywhere. Okay. Unhide all. Now the saw is going to be the hardest part. Because we're going to have to actually unwrap it properly. So now we need to decide where we're going to break this baby up. What I'm going to do for this purpose is just simplify the mesh quite a bit. So I'm going to double click the air, because we don't need all this detail. Start removing the detail, or I can probably go and find a lower version, but for now this will be fine. Let's just let, let's actually leave the detail as it is. I'm going to have to actually make seams. Go unwrap your VW. As you can see, there's one seam already. You don't need the, that one. So turn it off, turn it off under the display, turn off map seams. Keep the peel seams because that's what we're going to be doing. Open it up, go to edges. Under your peel options, there is edit, point to point, point to point is what you're going to be creating. There's also convert convert edge selection to seams. So selecting edges is painful, so just go point to point. What you do is, in this case, I'm going to select the, what I'm going to do is keep the side as one piece, keep the sole separately and keep the top separate. So the side will be one, the top will be another one. It will just make life easier. So let's try to detach the soul. So click there. I'm going to click all the way through from here down. You'll notice it creates a blue line. This is where, literally where the texture is going to be cut. You have to, because there's no way to avoid unwrapping. And back up to the top here. Just keep going all the way around until you've come back to the point that you started. Just go back to here. And that is your soul that you've got done. Now you need to somehow get this one looking okay. I'm going to leave this one as it is and hopefully it unwraps okay. If it doesn't, we're going to have to break it up. Let's start with the soul. Click on the bottom. In order to know if your seams are actually functioning, under your peel options, there's a little dotted rectangle with a solid red. Graph inside, uh, check it, red, square, the arrow, I don't know what else to call it. It says expand selection to seams, and you can see we've done it right because it's actually done that. And now you're going to go to the pelt option, which looks like a little dog tag, but it's actually an animal pelt. Flat, click on it, click start, click on it. That is the bottom of your foot, flat it out. I don't like pelt. This came, unfortunately, from Maya. Because Maya had no other real unwrapping tools, and they thought Pelt was the best idea that that thing since sliced bread. I'm just fortunately I disagree. But we're going to leave it for now. Select the side one, expand selection to, and then just go Pelt again. Click Start. Unfortunately, the outer border is too small, so let's go and say Select Stretcher, which is exactly what it is, or Select Stretcher, whichever way you want to do it. And then just scale up your stretcher. Go to your freeform mode. And hold control to make it bigger. So this is literally the boundary that it will stretch to. Try to put it in the middle. Now select pulse UVs again and start it again. Click commit. That's already a lot better. And now you've got your shoe in two pieces. As you can see, it's distorted crazy. So what we're going to do is go relax UVs by polygon. I'm going to set the amount of iterations to a thousand because now this is a more of a dense mesh, and I'm going to set the amount to a thousand and just let it go. The sole actually looks pretty decent. That looks a little bit broken, as you can see. So let's go and fix that. I'm going to grab that one. The sole actually looks pretty good. Let's go see what else we have the sole actually looks good. So I'm going to keep the sole separate so we don't want to grab this. This, unfortunately, let's try and relax it. Just sometimes it needs to. It looks like it's relaxing, because that's exactly what it's doing. It's just trying to stretch the kinks out. Sometimes you might have to just select. 
parts of it. So in this case, I'm going to select the input that's not working. Relax that on its own. And sometimes I have to go to edge, which is not the best way to do it, but it does work a little bit better than normal relax. Then I will go back to polygon and let it just keep it going. Let it go as long as it can. If you can straighten out as much as possible, let it go. Okay, that's about it. And now you can see it's perfect squares. Here's the downside. Because you've got multiple pieces now, you have to make sure that they each one to one. What that means is that the texture on the side is not less detailed than the texture on the bottom. So you have to grab them both. There's a rescale elements. Click on it and just make sure. If nothing happened, that they were perfect. That means they were perfectly one to one, which is awesome. And convert it to a poly. There we go. And now we can connect these two. We can actually connect all of them. Let's start with the sole. Attach, attach, just attach it. Because we're going to detach it anyway when we're going to take it to mud box, so it makes no difference. And now we're going to add a unwrap UVW again. This time we're going to make sure it's one to one. Because as you can see, the bigger checkered texture is going to be blurry, while the smaller checkered texture is going to be crisp. It's that easy to understand. It's going to be very crisp. So we're going to quickly go and say, open up the UV editor. And we're going to make them one to one. So I'm going to select all of them. Just literally drag select everything in that view. Rescale elements one to one. You can see they made them perfect one to one. And now we're just going to have to pack it. In order to texture something, it has to go inside this little checkered block. Otherwise, the texture will fall out of it and you won't get anything. So let's go and pack it. There's automatic ways to pack it, which is the lazy man's way to do it. So we're going to do it the lazy man's way. And then I'll show you why you shouldn't do it the lazy man's way. Pack UVs. This way, you'll never ever use this for gaming. Because you have to pack it as tight as possible because you only have a 512 texture or a 2048 texture for the whole body. And as it is, some of the textures are really blurry and pixelated. It's because they can't go any higher than this. And now there's recursive package, packing or linear. Linear is like if you're doing a box, it's simple three or four, five, six sides, whatever your container is. This is pretty unique shape, so just go recursive, click OK. And as you can see, there's a wasted amount of space. Lots of it. So what I'm going to do in this case is try to pack it as best as I can. We will never use up the entire space perfectly. Because what I will generally do is pack this. And then if I realize that I can't pack it any tighter, I will actually bring in something else. Let's say I make another buckle later on. I will flip into that space and add the texture into it. It's just a lot easier. Let's bring this as close as possible. I'm going to bring this around here. And then this will have to come somewhere. I'm going to rotate this and try to fit this down here. It doesn't make a difference which way as long as you get it use up the space efficiently. In this case, because there's so many round shapes, it's going to be very difficult to use up efficiently. Let's rotate back. You have to do this to every single thing you ever going to texture. Always. You can't avoid it. There's no way to avoid it. Free for mode. Hold control. I'm just trying to get it to fit in. And as you can see, we're going to be missing out a lot of space. So we're going to live with it and say, later on, I'm going to pack things into Yeah, I can pack in from the other belt buckles, other cap fabric, whatever else I need. If you need to bring this into Photoshop to texture or the mud box or ZBrush, go to Maps. Sorry, Tools. Render UVW Template. The most commonly asked question is, how big should my texture bed be? Okay. In gaming, there are rules. If, you have a, if you're running it on a decent gaming machine, yeah. no, there's nothing on here, but I'll check around when there's light. <laughs> okay, what does it look like? Sorry. Okay, so if I find anyone, I'll bring it to you. Okay, so in gaming, I don't like this method, but most of the bigger companies like Naughty Dog and Epic use it. Is they have a one or two format for the head and a one or two map for the one or two four for the whole body. If you start thinking about it logically, that is not the best way to do it because the texture on your face is going to be so crisp, and so beautiful, and the texture on your body is going to be so blurry. I rather have them one to one because it's not that important. 
to me, it bugs me if I'm running through a game and there's the wall texture's crisp and then the rock texture next to it is blurry. It just means the guy was not paying attention to what he was doing. All you have to do in Unity or Unreal or any of the gaming engines is once again slap a check and map onto everything in your scene, tile it 20 by 20, whatever it is. If there is a distinct scale difference in your check and map, fix it. Or go and adjust the scaling of your textures accordingly. It's the best way to do it. Okay. So in this case, I'm going to render it out. And if you're going to do it not for gaming, you have to go minimum 2048 because HD is 1920 by 1080. And that does not mean you can bring the boot super close up because it will not hold up. You have to go minimum of 4960. And as you can imagine, if you've got 20 maps in your scene or 300 maps, it can get very heavy. I like to go minimum of 496. I can always shrink it down. You cannot give more detail. This is not a CIS, oh, it's an a CSI. You cannot add detail where there is none. It's just called blurred wall pixels. It's just blurry. Click render the UV, UVW template. Click on the save option and save it out. Just make sure it's Texture. I'm going to call it boot guide because that's exactly what it is. It's a guide layer. Save it as a target. And, well, 24 bit is fine. And then you can revert it to a poly. And now I'm going to det detach it again. I'm going to go into my mesh and say, okay, this piece, the front of the boot, detach, back, detach. And now I want to give this some thickness. As you can tell, it's just a flimsy, thin little. The best way to put it, single plane mesh. Let's give it some thickness, just these two pieces. You don't have to give the whole thing. If you want to, it's probably better just for this one, but let's go all the way and say shell. I'm not going to give them both the same shell because I want this one to go in. I want the both this one to go out and this one to go in so they don't actually cut through each other. So I'm going to go shell and set this one to go out to maybe 20. Let's see. And because I'm going to put a smooth in it, let's add some segments to this side here, these edges. That literally does edge segments. I'm going to set as 4, same in this one, shell. This time I'm going to push it in instead of out, also 20. And now I'm going to add a turbo smoother to all of it. Grab the sole and turbo smoother. Half 2 maybe. Let's see what it looks like. Now I'm going to get rid of the check map because wow, it can be really overpowering. Let's see if it's not going through each other. Please remember the smooth in Mudbox and ZBrush are entirely different to the smooth in Max. So your results might be a little bit different. Okay, I'm going to fix this issue I'm having here in this mesh. It looks like I've got a double line, which I don't want. Just get rid of one. I'm just going to get rid of one. Of them. You can add two degree detail after you've animated. You can also save out UVs if you've by mistake forgotten to animate them. You're already animated. Okay. Let's start exporting it out. I'm going to export it this low and bring it back in this low. It's going to be this low into the render time. Okay. I'm going to convert this to a poly with the shell. There you go. And I'm going to make it into one mesh just so it's easier to export. Especially these two pieces. And then the rest of it I can actually keep the same. Let's give it names. Boot. Tongue. If you've installed Gozi for ZBrush, you can just click Gozi and it'll take it straight to go to ZBrush, but I didn't, so... And plus it won't let me install anything on this machine. So I'm just going to quickly export it. Export selected. Okay. So you export selected. Everybody can have their own method of doing it. I like to go to my... Let's go. And create a folder saying from Max and from ZBrush or Mudbox, whatever I call it. Or for whatever makes it easier for you to understand. This way I know sorry, this way I know it's from Max and not from ZBrush. Because you can get have so many things happening at the same time that you get confused. Call it boot heel. Please not FBX. If you've got animation and you've done a nice little walk cycle and you want to bring it into to Unity, yes, FBX is the way to go. Please don't forget to take animation. I had a lot of students saying, but if I can't see my animation in Unity, it's because when you export it out of Max you forgot to take animation. It's not on by default. Okay. So if let's say you want to bring it into Maya and you want the rig to go with it, select everything, export as an FBX, and Bob's your own. Okay. 
now we're going to export it as an OBJ. Okay. Save it. There are options down here. For Mudbox, for ZBrush, whatever you want. I'm going to click ZBrush. Export. It will give you errors if there are any. Luckily enough, there isn't. Export this one. Okay. You will have some issues if you, like you said, triangle. ZBrush is not that bad. Mudbox will shoot errors at you like there's no tomorrow. You just ignore it. Okay. It's because it doesn't prune, it doesn't terribly affect the smooth. If it's not smoothing bad in Max, it's not going to create a bad smoothing. Z brush and Mudbox. Okay, there we go. Before I even go and touch my Z brush, I'm going to open up Photoshop and show you why we did that little funny and rapid texture and all that loveliness that we did. Sorry, let me just quickly continue file. And now I'm going to go open it. So I'm going to go to there say textures, open up my guides, and there it is. Double click on it and call it guide layer. If, and a lot of the time I texture almost everywhere I work at, because that's what I like doing, and I light and I rig and I, and I don't animate because I don't like animating. Under normal, switch it to screen and start creating a new layer. I'm going to call it base, drag it down and call it base color guide, because that's what it is. If you don't know, and most of the time I don't know, somebody unwraps it, I don't know where they put the nose or the buckle in the whole thing. This, this is a simple unwrap. If it's an entire character unwrap, I sit there going, what is this little left pixel? So I like to call, create a little color guide for myself, so I go shift F5 to fill it. I'm going to fill it with green. Maybe green is a bad idea. Let's pick something else other than green. Let's go for a gray, because at the moment we can't see our color guides. And there you can see your guide, and you can texture it while the guides are. Let's go and fill it out. If you don't know what these pieces are, I like to take my little lasso tool. It doesn't have to be accurate. You just need to know what these mesh these little shapes are. And go and color them differently. Shift F5. And say fill. And then I'm gonna fill the rest of this. Let's go over here. And I'm going to select this one now. I hate the lasso tool but for this it's a lot quicker than trying to use your pen tool to follow around. And plus, I don't have to be really be accurate. And hopefully somebody's teaching you Photoshop, because unfortunately that's not my name. Please learn Photoshop well, because as a 3D artist, you will be using it a lot. Probably almost as much as you're doing your 3D stuff, because everything's got a texture. Now we've colored the tongue, the back of the boot. Let's go and create the color. The, the reason why I separate this, the side of the sole to the back is because you can have different textures, and that's a perfect scene. You can have a perfect edge seam and no one will notice, oh, there's a bit of wear and tear. No one will ever notice that there's a seam issue. And there we go. Shift F5, and there. And now, if I'm happy with this, everything's got its own color. I'm just going to quickly go sh Control Shift S and save it as boot. There's multiple ways to name it, depending on what company you work for. At Luma, it was called DIF for Diffuse, B for Bump, A for Alpha, M for Mask. N for normal map. I don't know why they decided DIF because maybe people are stupid and they didn't realize D stood for diffuse, which is also color. I like to call it D for diffuse and raw, which means it's the raw Photoshop file. And then you bring it in. So you select your whole mesh, press M. Let's create it calling boot texture. Any of the new slots. Make sure you assign it. And now you're going to go get the texture. And then you diffuse where you put the check in. Click on the block, go under bitmap. Anything outside of the program is a bitmap. Okay. Go into here, go to yes, go to scenes, and then just find where your texture is. In this case, I'm going to grab my raw. It'll ask me if I want to flatten the layers or if I want to bring one layer at a time. I just flatten it. And then, if you want to see it, maybe it'll take a while. There you go. Now you can sit, tell. Now, as a color guide, if I'm texturing this, I go, okay. Everything blue is the tongue in the front of the foot. Everything red is the back. The sole is this little yellowy funky color and gray is the bottom of the sole. And at least when I'm texturing it, I know exactly what it is. Okay. And people say, how do you start texturing this? Relatively simple. Grab your texture. In this case, it's a terrible texture example. This, my boot's going to be made out of like floor brick, but it's okay. I'm going to just save this as it is, and hopefully Max will update automatically. There's the little texture. Because of the new Nitrous viewport, it doesn't show textures very well. So I switched to Direct3D and 
I just switch out to the best resolution texture so I can actually see what the hell's going on. Because otherwise you can't see anything. Especially when you start doing fine details like leather. You want to be able to tell yourself, okay, I know what that, that's supposed to be. Okay, there you go. And you start texturing, you go, okay, there, I've overlapped by mistake too much into the other one. You can start deleting it. Go, let me get rid of that. I don't want that to overlap. Start deleting. I leave it as a raw file so it can automatically, I know it's a bit slow in Max, but at least you can see the update. Just give it a chance, it is a bit slow. That is the different uh, how you roughly texture and bring it in. This is literally roughly. You can spend two to three times as long as it took you to model the texture. Prop. And if you size proper because texturing is uh, tricky. And if you want to make it look good, you can use just let's just run through some of the Z brush and then I'll run through some of the shader and texture setup. Okay, my Wacom does not have any middle of top buttons any of it at all so I'm going to try run through it as best as I can. Okay, this is it rush. It will open up with a little menu. Just press I think it's the smaller than sign. Just give it some time, it takes a while to open. These are the examples if you want to see the sample seats they have. Like for example if you go to this dude over here. Prime example. The mesh is actually that's the, the detail of the mesh. There we go. That's the, actually it's quite low poly, as you can see. And then he smoothened it, started shaping it, smoothened it, started shaping, smoothened it, started shaping, smoothened it, started shaping. And then he literally brought this low version into max and displaced it. Don't need all that. That you can sculpt. Please don't do what he does and pose it because you're not doing a sculpt. A lot of people say, why don't we just model in ZBrush? You can. Unfortunately, some other poor person has to actually do the work for you and remodel it to make it work in game or in a cinematic. Under your tools, it's got your import option. Import it. If it's, in this case, I've got multi tool, multi pieces. I've got the front piece and the back piece. Go down to your Z plugin. There's a multi-map subtool master. Open it up. So you click subtool master. It will open up here. Multi-append, which means it'll bring in multiple objects from your max file and lay it out for you. So if you want to bring in your entire character and you export the root separately, then everything else separately, you can just click on multi-append. And let's go to the next one. I'm going to grab both of them. Click open. The moment you drag, really? This is how you're gonna, gonna work with me? Apparently, it doesn't want to multi append. Really? Okay, let's try import it. I think I just. Who knows? Welcome to software. I don't know why things break. I wish I knew that I would fix it. What the hell am I doing now? Yeah, that's one thing I wish I could have done is learn to script so then I wouldn't have to sit there and wonder why these things break. I wouldn't know. It's not that you could fix it because you'd have to go straight to the base broken code of some sort of thing. Okay, I'm going to grab, open one of them. There we go. Okay, and now let's, I'm going to try multi-append again. Let's hopefully it works this time. The key is it's supposed to bring all of them into it for you one time. Does. Okay, there we go. For some reason it did not want to work. The bright one is what's selected, the dark one is what's not selected. If you need to know what it is, there's a subtool master. Just click on the one you want, click on the one you don't want. To add detail is shift B. In Mudbox it's control and sorry, it's control D. Mudbox it's shift B. Okay, so we're gonna just go control D. I'm not gonna add too much detail off the bat, and then I'm going to do the same for the front piece. Control D. As you can see, it's a lot smoother already. Yeah. And now let's start doing some sculpting or running through some of the brushes. I can't zoom in and out, I apologize because I don't actually have a right mouse button option. I can, to rotate, you click literally on the canvas, the background. And you can rotate it. Okay, to pan is Alt and click on the background. 
And if you need to stop, just stop the cat. I mean, on whatever you see. Okay, let's go start. Now I've got my little reference open and say, okay, there's some creases. If you need to do this, start with a simple standard brush, is what it, the default is. And just start drawing in a, I like to call it blocking out. So up top is your focal and your draw size. Focal is how your hotspot, as you can see, the smaller inside red circle. And there's a bigger outside red circle. That's just a fall off. It's almost like, it's actually like painting in any other program. If you want it to be a harsh edge, just make those two circles very close. I'm going to lower this down. And because there is no pressure sensitivity on this, I'm going to lower this down to about 15. The Z intensity is the pressure of the brush. And then you just start drawing it in. Alt subtracts, literally does the inverted selection. Okay. As you can see, I'm working on it very low. You can start off low and then work your way up. Alt digs in, painting it normally, digs out. Okay. Hold shift to smooth it out. Okay. And then once you say, okay, I need a little bit more detail to work with, you can add more. Control D again. And then just start. Sorry, but this is like working with the mouse, except for I just have the luxury of using Wacom, which is not much of a difference. If your smooth is too much because you don't have a brush, just hold shift, adjust the Z intensity to about whatever you think you're happy with. I'm going to set it to about 33, and just start softening it, because it was softening too much. I don't want to lose all the detail I just added in. And by default, this is set to this ugly red. I hate the red. I generally switch it to the gray or to the white one I had. Anything that's better, anything with a high highlight, so at least you can see what the, the details do, because on the red one you can barely see any of the detail. And then just start adding creases in, start cutting it out. Alt, once again, cuts in, normal brush brings it out. We'll start bringing it to the top, start softening it out, and you get the concept. We'll just do this. And spend as many hours on it as you would want, or as many hours that is needed. And then you can switch between the Z tools. So once you're done with this one, just click on the boot heel and say, let's carry on. I wish I could zoom in. It'd be awesome, but I can't. They're very little detail here, so you don't have to worry about it. So you just go, I'm going to add one more row of detail. I'm going to add a little bit more detail than it has in my reference. So wherever it, the heel is bent, I'm just going to add in some. I start with big details, same as when I'm painting in my book. Start with the big details, then work your way down to the smaller details because think of the big silhouette shapes. If you need to see what that does, switch color and see what the silhouette looks like. If the silhouette looks cool, you've done your job right. Don't worry about all the fine details because that's just going to take you a million years to sculpt from the beginning. Cover your entire character with fine details. Just go through it. Say, okay, I want more detail here. Start softening it out. Control D to add more detail if you need it. It's not going crazy. There's nothing wrong with going a little bit over the top. That's the thing about Zenbrush. Please just don't think it's a modeling. It is a modeling tool, but it doesn't make you understand modeling. It's just an easier way to do it. If you can't really model, I don't think you're going to ever really be able to model. Whether you're using Zbrush, Mudbox, because you have to understand the concept of the 3D space and how it works. And let's say you're happy with this and you say, awesome, now I want to add some stitching. Click on this. The top one is your brush. The stroke is how it paints. You can do free drag select. You can do, let's say, drag select. Let's up the intensity so you can actually see what it's doing. There you go. That's the actual fall off of the brush if you ever want to see it. Also. Then you can invert it and make it dent it in, like bullet wounds if you want, or bullet holes. Uh, then you've got the free hand, which I use between the dots or the free hand. Free hand is a little bit too loose because you don't have much control over it. It's not very pressure sensitive. Then you've got your drags, your spray. From spray, spray takes the brush. Let's lower the intensity a bit. Like if you've got something that has a little bit of a disease, it will literally do bumpiness all over it. Take that brush and bump it around. There we go. Then you've got your drag spot. It literally takes this brush and puts it in one after the other on top of each other. And that is really all there is to that brush. Those are the different ways of painting. Generally you use dots. Okay. 
and to go up and down a subdivision you go shift down shift D D will add and if you need to add again control D and you can see it started smoothing it out of there and then you just smooth it out do whatever you need to do to make it look better don't worry about us going as million polys because you're not bringing this into max because none of you really will let's do the stitching like I said type in S there's tons of brushes go through all of them I just want the stitching now the brush alpha it's that little line is the stitching pattern you got. If you wanted a cross stitch, if you wanted a different kind of stitch, make the actual map in Photoshop or in Max, project it, and you can make that one. So let's do this. I'm going to add in, let's go back to the back of the hill. I want to add some stitching in the back here. So we start from the top. Please don't paint off this uh, canvas because it will just rotate. Start from the bottom part, work your way up. As you can see, my stitching is way too big, so I'm going to first of all add one more smooth control D, and let's make the brush about 20. As you can see, there's your stitching. You can add it wherever you need. Let's say you want to zoom. If I can zoom in, I'll actually try to go. Oops, the lazy mouse is a little bit too much for this kind of a thing, this tightness, but you can go along the edges. If you want to adjust your lazy mouse guy under stroke, there's a lazy mouse option. Just make the lazy mouse less, so instead of 100, make it 60. This little line behind it is how long it goes before it starts drawing. It just gives you a chance to be able to draw as best as you can. I don't even do stitching in ZBrush. Most people, I've seen a lot of people do it, but I think it's the best. And then you've got your other brushes like your clay. It literally makes it look like clay, so... Let's up the amount, add clay, remove it. So if you were doing something more more like, um, let's say, a metal, uh, metal, a concrete pillar, just start using your clay, start pushing it in and out, go crazy. We'll just give it a nice feel. The more, push it in, soften it out. Or this is another easy way to quickly add, if your body's losing, missing substance or volume, just go and quickly add it, smooth it out. Then my favorite is the clay builder brush. It literally does, instead of using the other one, I use the clay builder. Soften it out. It's just a perfectly straight brush and it adds build up very quickly, as you can see. People will export a block out of Max or whatever and sculpt. That's good for sculpting, not very good for animation. Okay, let's go ask. You can see there's tons of brushes. Please use your shortcut keys. Your left hand will be busy and you will get a cramp after about four hours. Just deal with it because I don't want to see people going standard, smooth. Okay, because that's just a, what it was. It even tells you why you're doing it. Just use the shift. Okay. So please listen to the tutorials. We'll tell you. Don't bother wasting your time. Use your left hand. Okay. You learn to use shortcuts. Okay. There we go. Now, let's say you got a leopard print or a, not even leopard, let's say a reptile creature. Let's go and pick something. So let's say, I'm going to pick your stand brush. I'm going to say drag select or color spray. Let's try drag spot first. Let's say drag that one. Under your alpha is the textures you can use. You can add in your own. If you've got a specific reptile pattern you want, please do it in Photoshop and export it. In this case, I'm just going to grab any of these. Looks like dots. There you go. Just drag select you want it, smoothen it. Drag. Drag. Alt inverts the selection as you can see. It kicks in instead of kicking out. Using this brush brush at a lower intensity can do skin pores pretty well. You just lower the intensity. You obviously see a lot smaller pores. Then you can go switch and see what else other ones do. Let's do this little one. You can do also like metal designs. This one is a Circle. You can do insignias. Just drag select it on. Okay. And then you can go through anything else. Let's see what else there's, there's cracks. There's cellular. Let's go what else there's, Let's go and put a crack on it. Crack this is crack on this somewhere. Don't worry, you can get lots of these. If you don't know how to make any of these alphas, please just type in ZBrush alphas and you can find them. Okay. And there's some cracks or veins, depending on which way you want to go. 
there's also different ways to apply this alpha. So you can go and say, I want to color spray it or a drag spot. So let's go color spray. Let's leave that one on. It literally takes that pattern and sprays along where you are leaving it behind. I think it's a little bit extreme doing it that way. I'd rather drag select. It's not that difficult. And then you can also do drag spot. What that does is it drags a spot, you let go. You say, I want that over there, there. It'll keep the exact same size as your brush. Just keep going crazy if you want. Okay. So your brush, what your brush does is under your stroke, what you're actually stenciling, literally it's a stencil, dragging it on, is under your alpha, and then your type of brush is under your stamp. And clay build up, mask. You can see, go through all of it. There's a crack one. The most commonly ones also used when doing fabric is called the pinch brush. What it does is it literally takes everything and pinches it. So let's pick the biggest. So let's go to the front of here. Where we see the screen up less. I'm going to hide everything else so we can just see the big front bit. And I'm going to make it small. The draw size a little bit smaller. That's too small. I want to pin, bring this, make this crease a little bit more prominent. So I just pinch it to the front. Same as this one over here. Just make it more prominent. Sometimes this is a little too heavy, but you can you get the concept. As you can see, then you can make the crease in the front of some formal pants go a little insane. You can literally draw it in with the pinch brush. And then soften it out. Always soften it out. And once again, when you bring it back to max, it will be the lowest subdivision possible. And you will export the map. But I'm not going to show you this this week. Let's confuse you less. And then I'm going to go down to the bottom of the boot, go shift D to go down. What I might do on the boots is if there's a lot of fine details, I might just go one subdivision higher because it's not that difficult to skin the boot. But don't ever spring it in like that. That's a crap load of detail. And it will kill your max and you will hate it when you're trying to skin it. To save, you go control S. And then you save it. Let's call it boot. And save it to wherever you want to save it. This one is going for from from max. I'm going to call it brush. I'm not even going to say from zbrush because it's actually a zbrush file. So I'm going to go call it zbrush and call it boot. Save. That's it. Okay. Let's run through Mudbox. Mudbox is roughly the same. There's nothing much to these programs. They're not like Max where you have to learn 80 million things. You just have to learn how to sit there patiently and learn to sculpt. If you want, just open the Mudbox ZBrush and just open up with whatever, let's say, click on one of these standard ones, like the head, for example. Now, the cool thing about Mudbox is navigation is so much easier than Max. It's Maya navigation. So everything is just hold your Alt button down, Alt. Left mouse button rotates, middle mouse button pans, right mouse button zooms. I don't want to see anyone touching this cube because you won't have the time while you're sculpting because you need your left hand. Okay, and you don't want to keep going here. Because that's, wow, it's just going to take you forever. Your life will flash past you. Okay. To add subdivisions on this, just make sure you go to your sculpt tool. There's sculpture, paint, curve tools, paint tool, pose tools, add your select move tools. Okay. What this does is it helps you retopologize it if you want to do it in my box. I find it a bit slower. So just go to your sculpt tools. And you've got your head. Go to your sculpt up here. There's your head on and off. Works in layers. Everything Autodesk has a layer option. There it is. To add detail, go Shift D. Now it's 8,008 polys. Only 2,000. And you can see, keep going up. I'm going to go down. To go up and down is page up and down. I'm going to go to level 2 and start sculpt. I'm going to try to use the brush, the pen again. And now, once again, there's your sculpt tool, which is your standard brush. Now this is set to uh, mirror. If you want to mirror in ZBrush, it's called it's X on your keyboard. That's it. Now, understand, your mirror works onto your pivot in Max. That's why I keep saying make sure everything's dead center. Because if your pivot's by mistake over here and you start sculpting here, it's not going to exactly sculpt where you want it to sculpt. This one is perfectly centered. So you can start sculpting. Okay, unlike ZBrush, control subtracts. Luckily enough, shift is still smooth. Okay, so you just start sculpting. Add more shape. Start adding in the nose. On the right is everything you need. Size, intensity, whatever you need it to do. 
smooth it out. Uh, let's see if I can rotate somehow. Okay. Now I'm going to hold Alt to dig in. Now in control to start digging in. Okay. Let's just make the strength a bit size a bit smaller, and then you just start digging. Too small. Okay, and just start digging in, softening it out, and then start building it out. Always start with the bigger shapes. In this case, I was just showing you how easy it is to shape your nostril if you're too concerned that it's not perfect. And you can even shape your lips. You can do anything you want. You can, you can excuse me, I'm just used to the other keys. Once you get to jump to between too many packages, it starts getting a little confusing. There we go. Start going control, not alt, sorry. Control. And start shift softening it. I'm going to go one down, one subdivision, because it's too heavy on this machine to do it at, at subdivision level. Just start shaping it. Just go crazy. Okay, the smooth, I find the smooth way too insane. So just lower the strength of the smooth. Once again, please don't click between sculpt, smooth. Just please hold shift to smoothen. Grab is easy, it's the same as the what it does is it's a move tool. In ZBrush it's a move tool, so you can literally just go, I want him to have more of there. You just go crazy. Okay. Start shaking it. Move the nose because the nose is not uh, pink enough. Whatever you want it to do, just go crazy. Okay. Then you've got your pinch brush. It's exactly like uh, so it pinches it and eventually you get a fine line. Every sculpting package deals with the wake of the thing. I've got a bamboo that I use at work and it works beautifully in ZBrush. Then I've got the Intuos at home and I have to press so hard for it to actually do anything. It's just, I think it's a driver issue or whatever it is, but not every single package deals with the sensitivity of the wake-ups. As you can see, now I'm getting more of a chiseled, hard edge. Now, flatten is exactly what it does. It flattens. I don't like my nose. You slowly start flattening everything out. Smooth it out and start moving around. And you can literally flatten out the entire face until you say, let me start again. Okay. And then you've got your foamy. Foamy is good for literally what the brush says it does, foam. Okay, it doesn't do a perfect stroke. It does more of a noise. Picture a noise inside a brush, and it's painting a noise. You can see it's already bul bubbly. Then you've got spray, which is awesome. It's the same as uh, doing the painting of the, what you call it, the stencil. In this case, here's the stencil right over here. You can paint it. Let me just go to a higher subdivision. Otherwise, we will not see any of the detail. You can start painting your detail you want. Then you also got your repeat. That's good for doing piping. I don't know what this one's trying to do right now. But you can, it literally drags and strokes the pattern you've got over there. I prefer imprint in all of them, because if I'm going to have a pattern, I want to be able to place it where I want. Okay, and control invert. So if you notice the vein sticking out at you, this one, it will stick into the object. If I'm going to do anything, whether I'm doing an elephant or in this case looks like a leaf texture, just do it this way. It's smoothen it out, do whatever. Don't sit there painting it because the problem is you get some ugliness on the overlay. And then you can switch any texture you want. Like for example, in this one, let's say I want this one. Okay. Then you can say I want it to go in rather. Here's the problem, if you don't have this one, it's got no alpha information on the outside, so you get this perfectly hard edge. Just rather, if you need to go and soften it out, and then go and add more, soften it out. Or just be smart and go into Photoshop and make sure that it's literally a round circle, feathered. Rather have it feathered than trying to paint out this shit. Okay. Let's pick any other one. Go crazy, there we go. You can literally pick any brush and see what they do. And some of them have different intensities, so just play around with what they do. Like this one, you can barely see, so you just have to up the intensity, and you can see what it does. Okay. You can play around and see what they do. Each one has a different intensity. Some might dig deeper than others. And you can just smooth it out if you want. Whatever you need. Play around. Wax is literally wax. It's the clay brush. They prefer, they prefer to call it wax. So you build up. There we go. This is perfect if you're doing a candle and you want the candle to be running down the side and you want that nice natural feel. 
you can use this. That's probably still use the sculpt brush. Then you've got the spray. It's the flattens it out. It's almost like the flatten brush. So for this is trying to give you a feeling of using a spray tool when you're using real clay. Then you've got fill. I don't know why I fill, but okay. Fill, I'd rather just use wax or standard or any of those. And that is it. If you want to paint it and then you're happy to say, I want to paint this beautiful head. Ignore the prettiness, it's beautiful. Go to your paint option over here. Make sure your paint tools are selected down here. Click paint. Right click. This is where, if you know Photoshop, it's easy. Click new. Make sure it's 204A map. Call it base skin. Click OK. And it asks you if you want it to be a diffuse. And you say yes. There's opacity on the side here. And then you can pick a brush. And you say, I want it to be more of a skin color. Let's pick that color so you can actually see. Then you start painting it. This is one way to texture. I don't texture it this way. I'd rather do it in Photoshop. I just have more control. This is just more of a manual, easier way to, for people that don't know how to texture in Photoshop. It's just a lot easier. Then you just pick your color and you go, I want red now. And luckily enough, this guy actually bothered at wrapping this head. So if you want to see what the UVs look like, just right next to the 3D view is the UVs. This is the head flattened. Much else to it. Now let's go run through textures and shader setup. Once again, import your mesh if you want to. You can go import boot. Let's go. Okay, it's probably hiding under the heads. So let's not think too much about it. But you import and you're done. Okay. Exporting displaced maps are relatively simple. You go export map and you pick the map you want to export, whether it's an AO, a diffuse, a displacement. And I will show you what a displacement is there now, so you don't sound confused. Let's reset this file and start with a simple, clean file. I'm going to create a floor. Center it out. Kill all the detail. I don't need any of it. And then I'm going to create a sphere. I'm actually going to create two of them. Just duplicate it from that one. And place it in the middle above the ground. And I'm just going to quickly create a camera. Control C to create a camera here. Yeah. And now let's set it up for main floor. I'm going to just assign any material for now so it's gray. First of all go to your render setup. Go all the way to the bottom where it says assign render. Under default scan line click the three dots and go to video main floor. Under your global illumination tab, it says skylight illumination from IPL, which is not bad. It's image-based lighting. That means you can take an HDRI, and it will cast shadows from wherever the sun is in your HDRI. I don't need that. I'm just going to switch it to skylight final gather because it's going to take a lot longer to render that way, and then you leave the rest. Let's go create a light. My nitrous viewport is turned off, so it won't be a pretty looking viewport. Let's call it shader, texture. Setup. The difference between the texture and the shader, shader is the texture is your brick, the shader is how the light reacts to that texture on your brick. Because not everything is equally lit. Not every this highlight is not the same everywhere. Your reflection is not the same everywhere, and that's where the shader kicks in. So let's go do that. I'm going to quickly grab the one on the left and slap in. Let's call it sphere one texture. Duplicate this one over after a minute. Yeah. And just assign that one to the left sphere. The right sphere will be mental ray. We'll call it sphere 2. Zero 02, and we call it mental ray, MR. And you'll see the difference between the different shaders and the setup. There is a cool little plugin. It's, the, it's more like a program. Uh, first of all, don't ever render 640 by 480, 128 by 720. That's half HD, it's more acceptable than uh, trying to do 640 by 480 which is even lower than now. Right click on camera, show save frame. At least now you know it's frame fine. Let's just add in the light and any light, it makes no difference. I'm just going to add in the skylight, standard. Set it to about 0.1 and then add in a directional light which will be a mental ray area spot. Drag it on. I'm not going to be too concerned about the hard shadows because right now I just want to show you what it does. 
there's a little crazy bump plugin in the animation one module four software folder. I'm just gonna run it quickly. What it does is I used I, I used it a lot in the gaming stuff. Is if you've got a simple bump texture or color texture, whatever texture you've got, whether it's a bump or a diffuse, you can make a lot from it. In this case, I'm going to make a normal map, displacement map, and a specular map from the color. So I'm going to go to my texture and say I want this brick one. Open it. What the first thing it'll ask you is which way you want the brick to go, in or out. Where is the grouting in? And when it comes to 3D, or well, in Max, this case, the white means it's coming towards you, the black means it's going away from you. So we will pick the shape on the left and not that one. Maya is the other way around. And as you can see, we've got a nice little... This is used mainly for gaming, because you can see the real-time wall with a normal map. If you turn off the diffuse, for example, that's just the illusion of depth. There is no actual depth. And that's what we're going to use. So I'm going to save all of it. There's not much to it, just save all textures. I'm going to create a new folder called Crazy Bump. So I don't override my existing textures. Please don't ever by mistake save them. Or do what a lot of people I work with is they work in your Photoshop. I, if I have 80 layers, I will always leave it as 80 layers. What they try to do is when they near the client is happy, they try to flatten it all down to one layer. This is for speed's sake. But if they make the one mistake or make one change or the, they change their mind, which happens quite often with clients, you are screwed. That means you have to redo that entire file again. You will know when it's done when the little ball pops up. And maybe an error, a crashing error will pop up as well. Let's see. So I'm right now I'm doing a normal map, display map, occlusion map, specularity, and a diffuse. The diffuse is already there. Just close it. You don't have to worry about it after. Let's just give it some time. Yeah, it'll break. It's fine. Let's go and do the first one, the straightforward max one. Under your diffuse, once again, there's color. Go to the box next, block, box next to it, and bitmap instead of the check it or whatever it is. And let's go and find our textures. Grab the diffuse, open it. If you want to see it in your viewport, please click assign. It's the little checkered light and the light bulb next to it. You can see there it is. Now I'm going to do the same thing on the metal ray one. I'm going to switch it to an arch and design shader. Let's pop it up. At the moment it's a highly reflective shader. We don't need it to be reflective. It's concrete. Let's just make it shiny. So in order to make it just have the highlight without the shine, click on highlight and final gather only. Now we've got the highlight minus the actual reflection because the floor does not need to be reflective unless it's built. Click on the block, next color, put map and go find it again. Sign it. Now each one of them are identical minus one's got a speculate and the other one doesn't. So you render this as a test. See what it looks like. I want to show you the big difference what a shader can make versus just slapping the texture on. Don't get me wrong, it looks cool. It looks like a floor texture. There's no real detail to it. The difference right now is that this one's got a specular. Now the bump. Bump is the illusion of depth. It gives you the illusion that this, uh, these, bump, these tiles are actually coming out at you even though they're not. Don't use a normal straight bump. Set it to one over here and set it to a normal map. Normal maps use 3D data. Click on normal map, click on the normal map on top here. If you wonder what a normal map looks like, it's that weird purpley one. Click on it. And now, let's just adjust this highlight. This is too insane. Let's just soften it out a little bit. I'm going to go to my, how to soften it out is just go to your glossiness and make it 0.5. Let's see what it looks like. It's still too insane, 0.3. Way too insane, 0.2. Let's also lower this. Now we might have to go even lower than 0.2. Let's go 0 0.1. 0. Is it doing anything? Wow. Okay. Let's try adjust the other ones. 0.2. And okay, finally something's happening. Awesome. 0 0.6. No, 0 0.5. It's just too crazy. The 4 does not need that much of a highlight, but it's nice to have a little bit. So I'm going to set it to about 0.45. This might look pretty in the ball, but it might look terrible when you find your render and then you realize it needs to be a higher specular. So then just easily adjust it. You have to unfortunately do renders when you texture it. I'm doing shaders because you won't know what the shader looks like. And you 
can already see the subtle difference in how the light hits it, and it's already giving the illusion of depth. Okay, the easiest way to do it is I'm going to go and turn off the color, because the map, generally the color throws your eye off. When I'm doing a bump map or displacement, I turn off the color, just to see what it's looking like, and then I play around with this. Intensity set to 1. I'm going to set it to 1.5 so you can really see what it's doing. Because the color that will not sell it, it's everything else that's happening underneath it that will help you sell the believability of the texture and your shader. So that's just you can really see how it's receiving light. It gives you the illusion and the f it's fake that it's actually there, but it's not really there at all. Now the best thing is combining normal maps with displacement maps. Displacement map is what you're going to use. The moment you've most of you have asked, if I bring in my t-shirt and I do all the creases, how does it translate back into Max or soft image? It's called a displacement map. Please don't use that displacement slot. It's slightly buggy. Just go straight to the metal ray connection and turn on the displacement here. It's either 3D displacement or height map. I like to use height map. It gives me more control. In the slot, go and actually grab your disk. This literally tells you it's a displacement one. Render it because that's the only way you're going to know how Every scene, that is, it's all the scene dependent on how much it pushes out. At the moment you can see this is insane. It's displacing, it's crazy. You can really see by the silhouette. Just let it finish the boring one. It's too much displacement. This is not the friggin' mountains. It's a little tile. But you can see what displacement does by over-exaggerating. So we're going to kill that down because obviously 10 is too far. So we're going to set it to about negative 1. And what? Let's see what that does. And obviously check it. Negative one might still be too insane depending on it. I think in this one it might be okay. What I use displacement for is the silhouette shape. So if you look at it, everything in life as black and white, look at the character and say, where are the big wrinkles? Displace those. And use normal map to bring out the finite creases and wrinkles. That doesn't affect the silhouette. As you can see, it affects the silhouette quite nicely. It literally fakes the shape. This is still low poly. That's already giving it some silhouette detail. Excuse the bad unwrap because it uh, pinches a little bit. Because it's unwrapped to polars, it literally unwrapped to the top and the bottom. And that's why we're getting some interesting results at the top. Okay. So now we combine this. We say, okay, this is what it looked like. This placement looks awesome. It's got nice little crevices. Don't go too insane because it still has to be believable. Now because you've got this, don't make your bump normal map as insane. Turn it on. And set it to about 0.5, do another render, then turn on your cut. Because you want to test how much it goes and how it's affecting and how the light is affecting it. And the moment you add color, sometimes the color just throws your eye off and you can't actually see what the bump map and the, the displacement is doing. What I would do with this displacement map is I would bring it into Photoshop and blur it even more. Because I don't need the fine granules to be popping up, so I would literally open Photoshop. And you can blur it, literally blur the hell out of it. So go and one day they'll actually make these uh, legit. Go to my textures, go to my displace map, open it up. As you can see, when you look into your displace map, 128 gray on your displace map means that it will not budge up or down. So if you go into your RGB values and you're putting 128, 128, 128, it means it's perfectly flat. If I wanted to be able, I would actually go paint this displace map manually by myself because it would work a lot better. Because as you can see, this dark area will be more crevice than the lighter areas, and you don't really want that. But for our exercise, it's perfectly fine. I think it's too fine details. So just go filter, blur, Gaussian blur, make it 10. Mm, maybe 10 is too insane. Just go and maybe make it 7. Okay, let's make it 7. Let's see what that looks. Just save it. Don't close Photoshop. You want to see what it, look, it actually does. Make sure it updates it, and then render. Almost everything will have displacement maps. Normal maps, bump maps, specular maps. Specular controls how the highlight receives it. Glossy maps will reflect whether your floor has got a wet patch, or your floor has got a, I suppose, a dull patch, or a greasy patch, whatever you want it to be. Okay. I think that the bump map is too high, so just set it to about 0.2. This unfortunately takes a lot of time because you have to render it at the highest res you're going to see it, otherwise 
you will not be able to see the details. This is not light, like te testing and lighting you can render in half raising code. Awesome. Textures, you have to see it at the final quality or you will never know what it's actually doing. I'm happy with that. The light hits it quite nicely. As you can see, it's got a nice little specular. Some nice dense in. And then we just turn on. Finally, go to your general maps and turn in your thickness. And then render it again. And now you can see the difference between a standard max shader with nothing but a, a fuse. And if you want, I'll even be nice and give that max shader a bump. So let's go to this one. Open that up. I'm going to give it a bump map or even a normal map. But in the old days, it would just be a bump map. So, but we'll just give it a 100%. Normal maps are generally 100% because you will make that map on purpose. So let's just switch to normal map. Discard the original. I just want to keep it as separate. There we go. Now let's go grab the normal map again. Depending on the program, Max likes the lighter shades of purple for the normal map. Fortunately, other programs don't. It will be like a funny greeny, purpley. It just really varies depending on your program. Don't get me wrong, it doesn't look bad. Finally, it's receiving some lighting and looking so easy. But this is so much better on the right. Yes, the displacement might be a little bit insane, but it looks so much better. The one on the right versus the one on the left. Because this one looks too flat, the lighting hits it like crap. That looks so much better. Just play around. S spend the time to make your shaders look good, because leather does not reflect and have the same highlight properties or the same reflection properties as a brick. This floor looks different to the wall. The wall looks different to your chair, the chair looks different to your monitor. Everything looks slightly different. And every render, unfortunately, have different ways of setting up shaders. Luckily enough, V-Ray is copying the way Mental Ray does it, so at least now the shader setup is not awesome. And that is your textures and shaders.